working. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Okay, good evening, everyone. If we could take a seat, please. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Dennis McNamara. I'm the director of the Center for Beauty and Culture here at Benedictine College. And very happy to uh, have you here and very happy to welcome an old friend and a very accomplished person, um, architect Duncan Stroick. If there were such a thing as a rock star of Catholic classical architecture, uh, Duncan Stroick would, would be it. Uh, he's also a very accomplished person and a practicing architect and author, a professor of architecture at uh, Notre Dame. We had the good fortune to meet Duncan 31 years ago at a party in Rome. Doesn't that sound wonderful? I was 22 years old right out of college and just ran into, uh, ran into him at a party. And in very many ways, I'm here at Benedictine partly because he invited me to give a talk at Notre Dame where uh, Monsignor Francis Mannion heard me speak and asked if I would help him start the Liturgical Institute at Mundelein Seminary which then prepared me to run the Center for Beauty and Culture, so it's a great pleasure to come back here with, with you. I had the good fortune to write a preface for uh, one of his books, The Church Building as Sacred Place, way back in 2009. And the sentence that I wrote was, to read a collection of essays by Duncan Stroick is to read a narrative of hope. If you're 20 or under, or 25 and under, you might say, oh, classical architecture, that's what we do at Benedictine. That's what they've been doing at Notre Dame for a long time. That's what they're now doing at Catholic University of America. But, yeah, so, yeah, sorry, they, we were there, we were classical first. Um, but in 1995, when Duncan Stroik was making watercolors and writing essays about classical architecture, I think a lot of people thought this will never happen. Sure, they're pretty pictures, but then, uh, he built these buildings, and so you know some of his monuments at uh, Thomas Aquinas College, the chapel there, the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Wisconsin, and most recently, beautiful new chapel at um, Hillsdale College. He's a graduate of the University of Virginia and a graduate of the Yale School of Architecture, and perhaps one of your most uh, illustrious notations lately, Duncan is being listed in Who's Who in Traditional Building just this month from a Traditional Building Magazine. So please welcome our speaker, Duncan Stroud. Benedictine is very fortunate to have Dennis McNamara. Do you agree? <laughs> but what's beauty anyways? We were talking about that at dinner, and when I was a, a, a kid in graduate school 35 years ago, we never used the B word. I don't mean Benedictine. We never used the B word. Beauty was, uh, was verboten in architecture school. And um, so you guys are bringing it back here at Benedictine, and they're bringing it back all over the country in spite of what the culture is doing. There's lots of beauty and uh, uh, beauty will save the world. So I'm very honored to be here with Dennis McNamara, who's an old friend and uh, one of our most brilliant architectural historians and uh, an expert at sacred architecture and at uh, the liturgy. So really uh, kudos to President Minnis for hiring Dennis and starting the Center for Beauty and Culture and uh, really uh, tremendous uh, that he can also be participating in this new experiment uh, in classical architecture at Benedictine. It's a great thing, guys. I've taught a number of students from Benedictine, um, and they've all been students. <laughs> Good, you're laughing. They've all been great students, and I've uh, really enjoyed them. In fact, if you read my letter, which I wrote a long time ago to uh, President Minnis, is I said that Patrick Allis, who was a student at Benedictine, told me about what a great school this was and the education he got here. And he came to Notre Dame and studied architecture with me. And I said, if we can get more guys like that, we're, you know, we're in the money. We're doing well, and we want you to come. And uh, it's very easy to get in. It's like, e it's like as easy to get into Notre Dame architecture as it is to get on the football team. So don't worry, it's very easy. <laughs> anyway, I know I'm speaking to a broad audience tonight and I'm honored that you would come. 
And uh, maybe you meant to go to the other lecture tonight, but we're going to talk about architecture, and specifically because Dennis McNamara asked me to speak about craft um, and uh, architecture and craft. And it's a topic I'm very interested in. And so I hope that I won't bore you, but uh, President Minnis is always sending me these raven flies through. So anyway, I hope I'm, I won't bore you too much. But um, I'm interested in talking to you about a specific area of architecture that touches everything that we do. Now, I want to start with a quote uh, from the first uh, book of architecture that was written, the first treatise on architecture that was written. Who wrote it? Vitruvius, Vitruvius great. Um, Vitruvius Polio, Polo, the um, uh, friend of Ralph, Ralph Loren, um, he uh, was an architect at the time of Augustus, and it's the oldest uh, extant book on architecture that we have. He says, the architect should be equipped with knowledge of many branches of study and varied kinds of learning, for it is by his judgment that all work done by the other arts is put to test. This knowledge is born from craft and the exercise of reason. Craft is continual and repeated practice where manual work is done, using whatever kind of material is required for a proposed project. Reasoning on the other hand, is the ability to clarify and explain things that have been built by balancing ingenuity and rational thought. So craft and reasoning, those are two things that he wants us to know about. Now this is where it gets really interesting and it actually says this on the back of Bond Hall at Notre Dame. It follows therefore that architects who have sought to be skillful with their hands without formal education have never been able to reach a position of authority in return for their labors. Got to get a degree, guys. While those who relied only upon reasoning and scholarship were clearly pursuing the shadow, not the substance. But those who have a thorough knowledge of both, like men fully armed, have more quickly attained their goal with authority. S craft and reason, you need both. According to Vitruvius, what does he know? Now, one of Vitruvius's sons in the Renaissance, uh, who uh, is the fellow that our third president uh, studied, um, uh, has this to say about craft. Do you know who our third president was? The guy before Minnis. No, no, who, who? Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson wrote to his friend, uh, Colonel Cock, he said, in architecture, in architecture, Palladio is the Bible. And this is what Palladio wrote. Palladio was an Italian architect in uh, the Veneto region in the 1500s. He writes, if therefore men in building their own hab habitations take very good care to find out excellent and expert architects and able craftsmen they are certainly obliged to make use of still much greater care in the building of churches. Sounds like Solomon, right? He says that, or David says that about his house. And if in those they attend chiefly to conveniency, in these they ought to have a regard to the dignity and grandeur of the being they are to be invoked and adored, who being the supreme good and the highest perfection it is very proper that all things consecrated to him should be brought to the greatest perfection we are capable of. So craft and reasoning, skillful architects and able craftsmen is crucial to the success of the temple dedicated to the supreme being, the church. And it should also be crucial to other great buildings or habitations. Now, this is a building, um, Brooks Brothers on Rodeo Drive in Los Angeles, one of my favorite modern classical buildings by one of my favorite modern classical architects, Alan Greenberg, immigrant from South Africa and a big fan of Jefferson and Palladio and Vitruvius. And it's a very sophisticated 
uh, building with a kind of a triumphal arch uh, motif at the center with the pediment, two big pergola balconies and lower wings, and all to sell men's blue blazers and ties. So Brooks Brothers in Rodeo Drive. Now, what's interesting about this building and other buildings by some of my other mentors, living mentors, is these are contemporary classical architects who believe in the language of classicism, but are also very interested in using modern materials. Now, this building, what does it look like it's made out of? Plaster, stucco, stone. It's actually made out of GFRC, gypsum, they have to call it an acronym because would, you wouldn't like it otherwise. It's basically fiberglass, gypsum fiber reinforced uh, concrete. It's basically fiberglass and it was all made in a factory and erected in a very short period of time. The facade, I'm talking about the facade. And I think it's very beautifully done. The detailing is great. I mean, I don't really can't have any fault with it. And, but Alan and other uh, very fine living architects believe that one of the things that classicism can do today is use the classical language, use the classical story, but do it with modern materials. And modern technologies. And I agree that we can do some very neat things with these modern technologies. Alan's classmate at Yale uh, was Bob Stern. Bob Stern has the largest traditional architecture firm in the world, about 300 people. Many uh, very fine architects that I know work there, even people that uh, some, of, some of my best students work there. And uh, they do some, of the, some excellent work. This is a new building at uh, my institution. Does anybody know this project? This is the new art museum at Notre Dame the new uh, Racklin Murphy Museum of Art. It's about $60 million. It's phase one of a two-part project, and it will house our collection of art and bring in some more art, and it's gonna be right on the main street. It's a great location, and behind that, you can see the architecture school that was built. Now, the other thing that many contemporary classical architects do, like Bob Stern, is they use modern methods of design and uh, presentation. So this drawing, which is phenomenal drawing, almost looks like a photograph, doesn't it? This building's going up right now. And it almost looks like it's a photograph. Um, how do you think it was made? What does it look like? How is it drawn? Is this a watercolor? Is this pencil, pen and ink? What is it? Yeah, it's a computer rendering. It's a very sophisticated computer rendering that looks very close to a, uh, a photograph. It looks very beautiful. It looks like the building will look and this got you know nice people and some ugly artwork in it, which is what art museums need to do. Um, you know, just so you know, it's an art museum, right? If I take that away, you might think it's a you know a gym or a, a science building or you know uh, you know something nice. But anyway, it's an art museum. So um, and um, that's a joke, of course. But at any rate, um, so 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 the other thing that that many modern classes do is they use modern modern methods of, of why why would they do that well it's how architects work today we don't draw by hand very much we use maybe little sketches and stuff but we use computers so uh, many of these architects embrace that and we use uh, 3d modeling on the computer and uh, getting away from the hand and the old-fashioned methods and the argument is that um, that this is faster and better and more precise. And more precise is pretty good. Uh, obviously, this is still drawn by a human, so the human, humans sometimes make mistakes, don't they? I do. But at any rate, humans still make mistakes even though they're using computers, but the computer can be very precise in its drawing. And, uh, uh, the draw and so that's very, very impressive. And, and you could do this maybe more quickly and and maybe more cost effectively. And that's, and because uh, this, uh, Stern and Greenberg are very good architects, we must take their comments very seriously. Now, this is my standard of architecture. I say, if you could do something this good, you get an A. If you do something this good, we'll put you in the history books. Until I do something this good, uh, don't call me a good architect. 
you know, this is, this is the standard. It's a very high standard. And the great thing about classicism is that there's really wonderful things that have been built in two, two, 3,000 years of architecture. The really bad thing about it is there's really great things been built for 3,000 years, and it's hard to compete with the best. They don't have to be living to compete against. So this is my standard, and it's pretty high. And did these architects use modern materials, uh, steel, concrete, et cetera, and did they use the computer? They did an okay job in spite of that. So what I would like to ask is what is the best technology that created, what is the technology that created these great buildings and still hasn't been surpassed? Is it the T-square? Is it the triangle? Is it the pencil? What is it that hasn't been surpassed that allows these architects to do such great work from the 20th century, from the 16th century, from the antiquity? What is that technology? that has not been surpassed, at least that I know of. I don't know of any building that's as good as this or the Jefferson or the Lincoln. Do you? I don't know them. I'm happy to look at it and be disproved. But what is the technology that all these architects used that has not been surpassed? It's the human talent. It's the human intellect. And the human talent has three things that are crucial in architecture and I think in other fields too the mind, the eye, and the hand. All of you have it. Some of you, those three things work together well. Some work better, some work really well, some, some not so well. But that's, that's what we are all given, and we can develop them. And this gets to this idea of craft. But that technology has not been surpassed, and no matter what computer, no matter what machine I use, it can only be as good as my mind, my eye, and my hand. Do you buy that? Now, unlike painting and sculpture, architecture drawings are not the end. What's the end of architecture drawings? Yeah, the building. Whereas if I'm a painter or a sculptor, I work on the thing that is the final. It could be a drawing, could be an etching, could be a painting, could be a small painting, big painting, could be a mosaic. I do the thing which I'm trying to create. The architect cannot do that. The architect must, by definition, work with others, work with other talented uh, professionals like engineers, uh, and has to work with craftsmen to build a building. Unless it's a very small project, your own house or something, the architect does not do the whole work. So architecture is interesting in that way, that almost like uh, creating a symphony, we can draw, we can figure it out, but to execute it, we need all these talented musicians or craftsmen to, to do it. So one of the things that we've done at Notre Dame, and I particularly am interested in doing, is studying the drawing methods from the past in order to understand how those architects that we saw a minute ago, Palladio, Pope, Moderno, Michelangelo, and all the other nice things that they did, like the Sistine Ceiling or Bernini, to learn how they did it. I want to do something as good as Bernini. I'm going to learn how he did it. I'm not just going to imitate what he produced, but I'm going to try to follow the method. And what you realize is the human talent, the mind, the eye, and the hand are crucial to their success and the direct connection. So in the same way that we have tried to keep the discipline of hand drawing alive, so we have also sought to promote hand craftsmanship because the architect needs the hand to design the building. So wouldn't it make sense that the artist or the craftsman would also need the hand to create their work? That's the theory. Now, depending on what it is, you might point out that it's faster to prefabricate those columns in that wall in California or the new art museum, the stone, by using cast stone or concrete in, at our museum in Indiana. It's faster. 
And it also might mean that it's even cheaper by, than by doing it by hand. So let's just, for the sake of the argument, let's say in both of those cases, both very good buildings, that it's cheaper and faster to do it by using the machine and by using uh, uh, industrial methods of it, replication. If your goal is to do something of beauty, quality, and humanity, faster and cheaper, is that still trumpet? Does it still trump beauty? What's more important in a building? Faster and cheaper? More precise? Or is there a higher level? So I'm going to argue that it's better accomplished by the hand. What if it costs more? I say that's OK, because it will be worth it. And even more important in architecture, it will last longer. If I'm correct that you and I can do better work with our hands, and it might cost more, it might take longer, not only will we appreciate it more and the people using it today, but our grandchildren will appreciate it more and will still be around to appreciate. Now, focusing on craft, I've kind of talked about the craft of architecture. Now I want to kind of go all the way into craft of construction and how crucial that is to a building. And I want to talk about four things. And I could talk about 10 or, you know, there's a lot to talk about. And I've got to limit this focus uh, so, that we, so that you're not bored. Um, and I want to focus on four things that I'm particularly a fan of. Exterior masonry, stone carving, woodwork and furniture and artwork. I could talk about plaster work. I could talk about metal work, um, flooring or, or woven fabrics. There's a lot to, to painting, decorative painting. A lot of good things to talk about. This is what I want to do today, tonight. And um, I've been told, I, the parents in the room know about this, but do the students get all these Raven fly-throughs? Do you guys get fly-throughs? Do you know fly-throughs? No? I'm always getting these emails from the president about Raven fly-throughs, which makes sense since you're Ravens. And so I, I will try to bring in some Raven fly-throughs. That's a joke, but anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. OK, so exterior masonry, the craft of exterior masonry. So uh, this is an amazing photo of, of a single arch on a new building. And all the bricks have to be cut, custom shapes, slight uh, pizza slices in size. And they get, actually get smaller as you get to the middle of the arch. They're called French Vu and Evening. They're you Evening, Voussoirs. That's a joke, but anyway, voussoirs and this big arch. And I need these three guys to help me figure this out. I can draw it beautifully, but they have to actually cut it and put it in place and make sure all the joints don't line up. That's important in masonry that the joints, the vertical joints don't line up. So it's kind of beautiful uh, brick arch, brick voussoirs. These same uh, talented craftsmen help me do this whole building which has thick brickwork. It has molded brickwork. You can see the brickwork around the windows on the, the top windows on the left and right. There's a lot of brickwork there that comes out of the wall, goes into the wall. Some of it actually has molding around the central arch, uh, special bricks. They have to know where those bricks go. They have to use them in the right way. They have to have bricks that turn the corner. Um, and they have to follow drawings. And they have to do it so it looks beautiful with joints and, and mortar and so on. And then we have all kinds of nice stonework in there, too, so that the building gets polychromed. It gets this orange brick look, which is the campus has that. And it gets the limestone uh, working together. So and then you see this nice arcade, which has a vaulted ceiling. And then you see the front portico, which is in stone. And uh, we'll see that a little bit later. So the importance of craft, the importance of masons, to doing the craft, no matter how good the architect is or how good the drawings are, we want to see them using their talent, their mind, their eye, and their hand. I don't have this connected with the sound. No, OK, let's see. 
that sound. It was a really nice sound. These are eight columns uh, at a new chapel at Hillsdale on the inside. People told me I couldn't do this. It wasn't possible to make them structural. So these columns are 30 feet tall. They're in pieces. They're, they're shipped up there and then very carefully lifted into place without breaking and then threading the needle or needling the thread and with this um, epoxy glue to hold it together. But these will hold up the roof of the church and also the balcony. And that's my favorite mason there, making comments on it. And there's the columns partially done. So the, the second part of this was uh, this front porch, which is a circular porch, fairly uncommon in classical architecture, but certainly in the US, but has a nice resonance with certain buildings in DC and uh, uh, represent the founding fathers, such as the third president's memorial and that kind of thing, and the back of the White House. But at any rate, so here we have eight columns, also about 30 feet tall, that have also been lifted into place and they're also chamfered to fit the geometry of the circle. That is, the capitals and the bases, the square parts all relate to the center point of the circle. Um, and uh, you can kind of see they're kind of curved also at the top. But at any rate, uh, this is the first um, masonry dome that I know of on a public building in about 50 years. It's not huge, it's only 32 feet wide, um, but um, it's uh, all structural uh, brick masonry uh, sitting on uh, the stone, sitting on these columns. You can see there a lot of voussoirs, central stone. Those are, um, these are a rack of ribs, these ribs, very tasty. Um, nice running bond. And you get a sense of how the scale of it. And they actually, this, this dome was actually uh, laid in place from above. So you see that the joints between the brick, how they're very dark. It's because they have to come back later and fill in the mortar. They've been mortared like halfway, but they put in ropes at the bottom and they come back from the inside so it looks pretty. Does that make sense, anybody? So it's a craft, it's a very crafty. This was very crafty, uh, brilliant. Not what I planned at all. Early uh, church that we did, uh, also brick, um, dedicated to all saints, so it has carved in the metopes uh, the two uh, symbols of the 12 apostles. Do you know the two keys? Who's that? And um, then this uh, wonderful hippie guy is our stone carver. And we needed the stone put in place uh, so we could occupy the building, and he wasn't finished with it, so he actually climbed up on the scaffolding and worked carving this in the wintertime up on a scaffold up in Kentucky where it never gets cold, never gets below, you know, 10 degrees. It's very warm there. And um, he, he did this wonderful front uh, carving of uh, the uh, sup Marriage Supper of the Lamb based on the Van Eyck's. The chapel in California is a stucco building and it's full of hand carved work. Look at those ionic capitals with their egg and dart. Uh, look at the little, it's dedicated to Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, so the little roses above the capitals. A lot of detail carving, which is part of the texture, the leaf moldings, the, um, uh, the simple modillions. Um, and we also have some fancier sculpture above. But these are all made in, by stone. Oh, I love the, you notice the vertical fluting and the spiral fluting? These guys had never done the spiral fluting before. That's craft. 
the, the vertical floating is too. I could draw all these things. I could show them photographs of historic examples. They had to figure out how to do it. So lots of pieces of stone that had to be carved, carved by hand, partially, partially by machine, but partially by hand. Uh, most of this was made in Indiana, shipped to California, and um, the contractor was very, very against this. He wanted to do it out of man-made materials that would be cheaper and faster. In this case, um, we bid the price, we priced it out and had the GFRC priced out in California, which they make in California, and um, the cost was only about 10% more to use real stuff. And the GFRC is guaranteed, fiberglass is guaranteed to last 50 to 100 years, at least a minimum of 50 to 100 years, and the limestone should be, that's a joke, but the limestone should be, um, you know, two or three times that. Stone carving. Yeah, so one of my favorite things is stone carving. I love to see the handmade. You can tell me every day about these machines that can crank out flooring or panels or whatever. That's worth looking at for about five minutes. You bring a whole group of smart people in to look at a factory making stone panels, they'll be gone in five minutes. There's nothing to see. But if you see a guy carving a Corinthian capital, or in this case, a composite capital, or spinning uh, uh, a green verde column shaft, that's worth coming back to see. And it takes, a, it takes a while. These capitals that you see here on the right, isn't that brilliant? He puts it on a, on a, like a spindle so he can turn it. Um, weighs probably, uh, uh, probably a ton and a half. What's a ton, by the way? How much is a ton? It's a lot? Oh, yeah, it's a lot. How much is a ton? 2,000 pounds. So this weighs a ton and a half. So how much is that? 3,000 pounds. Yeah, that's a lot. It's more than I can lift. So uh, he puts this on a spindle and so that he can carve this uh, capital, and we had four of them at, this, uh, at the cathedral in Sioux Falls, St. Joe. And uh, then we did this very naughty thing, which the Romans did and the Renaissance did, which was we took marble, core marble, and we put gold leaf on it. You can see that above, a little bit of gold leaf. You're not supposed to paint marble, right? It's not, it's illegal. Um, but, so that means I should do it. But at any rate, um, this is another uh, with some Verde marble, and you see this beautiful capital <clears throat> holding up the Baldacchino. Look at, look at it close. Do you see the little um, colliculi, the little round things at the top of the capitals? Anybody recognize what that is? Think Valentine's Day. That's a heart, because this is a cathedral of one of the great early church fathers. Starts with an A. Heart burning. My heart is restless. St. Augustine. This is the key cathedral of St. Augustine. So the Baldacchino at the altar has his symbol of the burning heart. And I want to show you now the bishop's throne, the, ca the column capitals there. All this, of course, has to be done by hand. And here's the, do you notice that? What, what's on there? This is above the bishop's throne. Little mitre, yeah. So, and we finish it by hand. We carve it, we rough carve it with the machine, and then we use a pneumatic drill, and then we actually do it by hand. So this is what gets me really excited. The, the design, the craftsmanship, the artistry, and then the fact that the hand is doing it. That just, that's the best tool we have. Now, um, why is this picture in there? I don't know, it shows everything. Uh, oh, I know. So I want you to look at these columns again, these Verde Antiqua columns, which are all different, right? The beauty of the, the marble is it's all different. If you make this in a factory, you have to fake it. You have to pretend that it's different. So you make these different than those. And you know, I have tile like that in my house. But at any rate, but the beauty of natural marble is you have to, you, it's, it's gonna be different no matter what you do. Now, in order to make a round column, a cylindrical column, aren't all columns round, Duncan? Yeah, all right. To make a column, we start out actually with a square block, and then you chip it away until it turns into an octagon. Do you see that at the end? And then as it gets chipped away, then you start cutting it, and then the grooves make it more round, and then you finally get to a round column. So look at this. That's what we want to end up with. 
So that also is craft. It's very machine-like craft, but this is very beautiful and time-consuming and expensive thing to do. But it gives us something uh, fantastic like that. This is the best part of it. So the next topic I want to look at is woodwork and furniture. And I'm sorry I don't have any raven fly-throughs on this one. But uh, the, uh, probably all of you know, or many of you know, somebody who's good with their hands for wood. Is that right? Who knows somebody good with their hands and woodwork? Yeah, I mean, this is something that people in America are proud of to be able to use wood. We were just talking about this with Sam Roach about our tradition is wood construction uh, because we don't want the buildings to last too long. And um, it's, it's very available, the trees, and it's, uh, we can do it, and it's fast, and, and, and actually the craftsmanship is a little easier. But anyway, we have a very high level of craftsmanship in this country. And I just show multiple examples. We do a lot of wood. We tend to use mahogany because it's the cheapest stuff out there, and it looks beautiful, and um, it's fast. That's why we do everything cheap and fast. And so I show you this beautiful uh, ambo with the uh, trinity above, the name of Jesus on it, all the carving, the swags, a little bit of gold leaf, uh, just a sacristy, right? Just a workroom with amazing cabinets that go up 10 feet in the air and uh, very heavy duty. And then this amazing thing, uh, praise him in uh, Psalm, as you can imagine what that is, right? Praise him in, what do you think that is? See the little metal pipes there? It's the top of an organ that we just did, organ case that we just did. Um, so the craftsmanship on this is tremendous. Uh, also a lot of hand work on the carving, has to be. Um, this is a movable altar. Uh, this is a railing with uh, uh, tons of balusters so that you don't fall through them. Um, and uh, the typical pew, which is what all churches have, and that takes a certain amount of craft, and you can put a little bit of detail in there, and then that same bishop's thrown there with some beautiful rosettes and nice arm rests and little brackets down below and so on, just uh, to beautify it, humanize it, and all done by uh, Radigan Schottler, beautiful work. <clears throat> And then my best fly through for the wood is this, uh, a big or, or probably our biggest organ case in the cathedral. Does anybody know this place? It's a town um, in, what's the state? And uh, one of our, I, I say top 10 cathedrals in America, done by Emmanuel Masqueray, the architect. And the bishop was Irish. What was his name? Oh, thank you, yeah, Ireland. He was Irish. Um, <laughs> So the Cathedral of St. Paul, yeah. It's supposed to have organ music, but I guess I somehow didn't connect that. Why is that? Why isn't the music connected? He's not good at music for PowerPoints. But anyway, the, this is the carving's been done in uh, California, England, and in India uh, by Agrell. And then the Californians have come to Minnesota because it's gotten too hot in California, and they're erecting this. And this took probably less than a month to re-erect it on site, including the gold leaf swags. And this has a lot of hand carving on it, which you can't see a lot of, but um, the swags, the uh, motifs, has a little angel of what's your name in the middle? What's the lady's name in the middle? Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> Cecilia and uh, a couple of angels. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> it was pretty good while I heard it. You guys couldn't hear it, but it was really good. All right. So, and then the fourth and most important part of craft is uh, artwork. Very handmade in my view, uh, and crucial to my work is to have art. The real recovery of classical 
architecture is a recovery of classical culture. And classical culture includes all the fields, and uh, especially the trivium and the quadrivium. I don't know why it's so trivium. But, um, and uh, the art is the part that is, because of its figurative, classical art is figurative, human body is the highest image, and of course the trinity shown in human body is the highest image, and it's the artwork that is the most compelling in the classical sense. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna revive classical culture, we have to revive all aspects of classical culture, but in architecture, music, and art, painting, sculpture, mosaics, et cetera, are all part of that, and they are highly craft-based. There is disegno, there is talent, there is history, there's all those things, but it's a lot of craft. You do not have to be a great artist to be a great architect. You do have to be a great artist to be a great artist, okay? Think about that. So, and that's craft. <laughs> technically, technically, you have to be really good. So this is Leonard Porter and his early sketch and then his final sketch. At the time, this was my largest altarpiece. It was, it's about five and a half by 13 feet tall of the Assumption in Connecticut. And it's a beautiful, and we did the, we did the frame around it, but the, right, we, oh, we did the frame around it. Oh, we uh, had John Canning do the decorative art. He said, well, that's good. They did a fantastic job, everybody did a great job, but what do you notice? It's all part of it, right? It's all part of it, it's all necessary. But you, don't you notice the assumption? Don't you notice the central picture, if it's good? People shield their eyes uh, at St. Peter's in Steubenville because the art is there and it's not so good. So you don't, I'm not just saying that art is always good, but if it's good art, it's the focus. So Leonard Porter's great project for us. Uh, there's other artwork like this where artisans from Conrad Schmidt are painting um, these 12 guys up in the ceiling in Sioux Falls. Look at that. Look how big they are. That's how big you need to make a uh, apostle so it's seen 60 feet below. They have to be really big. And so he's bringing them back out in color. These two are Siamese apostles like James and John. Uh, the other guys get their own rondelle. Um, and then uh, for Cardinal Burke, we, we, working with Tony Visco in Philadelphia, we hired a number of talented artists. Tony did the angels uh, holding wheat and grapes on top of the Baldacchino. Uh, he also did this great painting in the narthex, which tells the whole story of Juan Diego and Our Lady of Guadalupe. And um, his, uh, uh, and, and, and Bishop Zumarraga's uh, desire not to uh, help him out too much, uh, and th all the miracles that happened. And then on the left, you see this great uh, mosaic uh, of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is as close as you can get to the original um, um, uh, mystical image of Our Lady of Guadalupe on the tilma, but it's done in a mosaic by the Vatican Mosaic Shop. So all these things are art, and to me, they're the focus of what I do, is to create a frame or a place for art. And there's a lot that has to be done to do the architecture, to do the carving, the stone, the wood, the plaster, but in the end, it's the art that's the key. And the hand is the most important there, in my view. New stained glass windows by Conrad Schmidt of the baptism and uh, the archangel stepping on, what's his name? And uh, then uh, this recent chapel for a boys high school in um, Tampa. You know, it's interesting, probably, how many of you all went to a Catholic high school? Did you have a chapel? Did it fit the, who had, who had a chapel at their high school and it fit the whole student body? Yeah, we used to do that. We used to have high, Catholic high schools had chapels for everybody. Because, uh, at least in my dad's day, the high school was next to a parish. Or if it was the Jesuits and they founded a high school, they built a church appropriate for the high school and it was turned into a parish. 
So this is a Jesuit high school. It's not a parish, but it has a chapel big enough for everybody. And uh, we do that for elementary school. Why don't we do that for high school? But anyway, a uh, new chapel. And on the outside, we have the two great, we have the Peter and Paul of the Jesuits, the Francis and um, St. Anthony of the Jesuits. Do you know who I'm talking about? The Benedict and Scholastica of the, of the I'm talking your language now. The Benedict and Scholastica of the Jesuits. Do you know who they are? St. Ignatius. St. Francis Xavier, yeah, so we have the two. There's this nice uh, symmetry in our tradition. Peter and Paul start it and then it keeps going. And um, for the Jesuits, it's Ignatius and St. Francis Xavier, they're, they're founders, as it were, okay? So um, uh, the, the, the stat, it's a very simple building, but two statues of the founders on the outside carved by an American, Cody Swanson, who unfortunately lives in Florence. So he has to live around all this beautiful stuff and he carves in marble, or he, he finishes them. He carves in, in clay, actually. Somebody else carves them in marble, and he finishes them up. So this is a raven fly-through of St. Ignatius. And Cody's talking to the contractor there about different um, metal carving implements and what they, a rasp, and how it can make the uh, clothing the vestment's more smooth or more rough or can give a texture this way. It can affect how the light comes on it. And these are really magnificent new statues. They're not copies, and yet they're fully traditional of these uh, Jesuit uh, saints. So four different topics that relate to craft <clears throat> and the need for a revival of craft. So I would like to leave you with this thought that if you want your buildings to last, you need, you're going to build them well. If you want them to speak to the human spirit, they also need to be timeless. The classical aspires to the timeless and to speak to people today and in the future. One of the things that's crucial for buildings to be loved is beauty. And beauty is reliant on designio, good design, and good craft. The handmade ties us to the human body, which, is, which it is representing or symbolizing. Beauty gives great joy to the artisans, the artists, and the builders. I've seen it. It brings great joy and pride to the clients and speaks to them long after the industrial products are rotted, corroded, rusted, and crumbled away. Thank you very much. <clears throat>